you very much. I have uh, no disclosures. So duodenal atresia is a common cause of congenital intestinal obstruction. And the anomalies really range from a stenosis or a web to a complete atresia in which there are two separate pieces of bowel as seen here. But regardless, it causes a bowel, an obstruction of third or fourth portion of the duodenum. So we typically see these patients shortly after birth presenting with bilious emesis. And on x-ray, you can see a double bubble sign, which is the classic x-ray finding. Show that here. So you can see here's the stomach, which is air-filled, and then a dilated duodenum here with no distal gas. So that gives us the diagnosis of duodenal atresia. And the treatment for duodenal atresia is surgical. So our procedure of choice is a duodeno duodenostomy, and that can be performed either laparoscopically or open. This depicts the classic diamond-shaped anastomosis in which the proximal duodenum has a little horizontal duodenotomy that's performed, and then distally a vertical duodenotomy. And the anastomosis is performed like this with the middle lined up with the end here. And this is what it looks like after the anastomosis is performed. So the, the stenosis or the atresia is bypassed and that avoids minimizing any damage to the pancreas, the ductal anatomy, or the ampulla. And a bypass is then performed with the anastomosis of the second portion of the duodenum to the fourth portion of the duodenum as seen here. So in looking at the long-term management of these patients, the, it's important to keep in mind that over 50% of these patients have associated congenital anomalies. And as you heard in all the previous presentations, this is really a common theme in pediatric surgeons because they tend to be associated with a lot of different problems. Um, about a third of the patients have Down syndrome, and many of the affected patients of duodenal atresia also have congenital heart disease, either with or without trisomy 21. So of course, any of the issues associated with these problems persist into adolescence and adulthood. In regards to the long-term complications seen after these patients have been repaired, there have been reported to be about 10 to 15 percent of complications in these patients. The first I'll be discussing is a mega duodenum. As you can see here on this upper GI, you see a very dilated duodenum proximally with a very aperistaltic portion. And these patients present with poor weight gain, frequent emesis, and abdominal pain. And interestingly, you can see this many, many years after the repair. There's a report in this study of an 18-year-old patient had to go undergo reoperation for this problem. Oftentimes, if the symptoms persist, they require a tapering or a plication of the dilated proximal duodenum, plus or minus a revision of the anastomosis if there's an associated stricture. And then other long-term complications, which the adult surgeon will see, um, is delayed gastric emptying, severe gastroesophageal ref reflux, of which many patients require a fundoplication, duodenogastric reflux, bleeding peptic ulcers. Usually these ulcers are seen around the area of the anastomosis, or just gastritis in the stomach itself. And of course, adhesive bowel obstructions can also happen. We do see this more commonly in the open repairs and not as much with laparoscopically, but either repair can, of course, result in adhesions leading to bowel obstructions. And just one other thing I wanted to mention, although the, the standard treatment and the procedure of choice is a duodeno duodenostomy, occasionally some patients can undergo a gastrojejunostomy, particularly in surgeons who are not very familiar with the disease process. And of course, the typical blind loop syndrome and marginal ulcerization that you guys are familiar with can be seen in those patients. Oftentimes, they actually do need a revision of the anastomosis or a conversion to a duodenodunostomy after having this performed. In regards to pancreatic anomalies, I'm going to mention a couple that can be seen in adulthood or the consequences can be seen in adulthood. The first of which is pancreas divism, which is seen in about 10% of the population. This is thought to result from a failure of the dorsal duct to unite with the ventral duct. And as such, most of the secretions of the whole pancreas drain into the smaller, minor duct of Santorini instead of into the major duct. 
as a result, there becomes a relative obstruction of the minor duct, and this can present as recurrent pancreatitis or eventually even pancreatic insufficiency. So the treatment for this is usually an endoscopic sphincteroplasty or sphincterotomy. Um, however, patients can often be diagnosed later in life. They don't know that a pancreas divism is present, and they can just have recurrent bouts of pancreatitis, and this is not seen until later. Of course, surgeons might have to manage the pancreatitis or the complications associated, and sometimes they require additional surgical procedures just for the chronic pancreatitis. Another pancreatic anomaly that we see is babies who can have certain consequences, of course, in adulthood is nasidioblastosis or congenital hyperinsulinism of infancy, also called CHI. Um, this can basically present as either a focal or diffuse form. I won't go into the management as a baby since it's fairly complicated and the diagnosis is fairly complicated, but the um, majority of patients have a diffuse form of this and often have to undergo a near total pancreatectomy. So as such, into adulthood, these patients often require long-term insulin or different type of glycemic medications. Uh, many of these patients have G-tubes or other type of enteral feeding access that often have to be managed by an adult surgeon. Um, the other thing to mention is that many of these have neurodevelopmental issues, particularly if the diagnosis was made later. Really, the, the outlook of the whole spectrum of this disease is associated with the age of onset, which typically does reflect the severity of the disease itself. And then finally, um, congenital cysts of the pancreas are quite rare, and they often are diagnosed in childhood, but sometimes they can be seen in adulthood instead. And they can either cause vomiting or jaundice by extrinsic, extrinsic compression of the surrounding structures, or just incidentally seen on physical exam or imaging studies done for something else. So usually these are treated um, either with resection or internally, internally drained, depending on where the location is in the pancreas. Fortunately, these tend to be in the distal pancreas, so oftentimes they can be resected with a small distal pancreatectomy. And I think that's it. I figured I'd go through quickly to make up a little bit of time. Happy to take any questions. That was excellent. I think one of the things I like to point out to the adult surgeons is that when you do the duodeno duodenostomy, you are bypassing it. You're not fixing the intrinsic problems. So uh, especially if they didn't have a complete atresia but had a web there, you still have two passageways. And it's not uncommon that I've been called that they have a duodenal diverticulum or somebody thinks they blew out their duodenum proximal. And really it's just the remnant of the initial pathway that was never surgically removed. Um, I have had somebody actually blow that out. Um, uh, from a stricture of the anastomosis. Uh, and so it can, it can mean you need to interrogate and ensure you have gastric good emptying through the uh, stricture, as she mentioned, that can develop. But um, don't expect that there's only one pathway. There really should be two uh, seen. Thank you. Thank you.